live from the world-famous Sunset Gower Studios in Hollywood. The best of a generation has arrived. Stories that matter and people who are making a difference. This is the Millennial Report. Welcome to the Millennial Report, From friends. From the trending desk, here's Wei. Yeehaw! On today's broadcast, we'll talk with TED speaker Mondo Quintana about the power of relationships in our lives and how they play a key role in getting what you really want. Also, it's graduation season. You know what that means, don't you? That means many millennials are moving on from one stage of their life to another. That's one big chapter. We're slamming the door shut on. I'm going to give you the commencement address that you have not heard. The commencement address you should hear. That is coming up here on today's broadcast as well. And a little later on, we're going to be discussing uh, whether or not you are where you thought you'd be at this age. Yeah. You are going to have to consider uh, your age right now and whether or not you have done something with your life you're proud of. There's a great column that I'm going to be sharing with you that touches on that exact topic. I look forward to uh, sharing it here in just a bit because it reveals some things that I think are very critical to any millennial uh, dealing with life right now. That's all coming up here in just a bit on today's The Millennial Report. Oh yeah, hello everyone. I am your newsman for News Generation, Wade Heath, coming to you live from the same place where they film Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, and... Uh, back in the day, Saved by the Bell. How many people knew that? I only knew that because uh, Screech, the guy who played Screech, Justin Diamond, he, he shared that recently. And I thought, right down these halls, this was where Saved by the Bell was filmed? Unbelievable. Who knew? That's right. We are here live at the Sunset Gower Studios in the heart of Hollywood. And it means a lot to know that you are with us, live streaming both on the web and... On that social media there. Yeah. Universal Broadcasting Network is where we are at. We are also simulcasting as a digital TV show. Uh, watch us now and join the live chat by going to ubnradio.com and jumping on channel 2. Or you can watch us on Facebook Live by visiting The Millennial Report on Facebook. Also want to mention that if you catch our show in podcast form after the live broadcast, then you are no doubt listening to us on Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, or the UBN radio show page. And you're welcome to watch this news program on demand by subscribing to the Millennial Report on YouTube, where the show and segments are posted every Wednesday following the live show on Tuesday. Just head on over to the Millennial Report on YouTube. All right. Enough of that. Let's dive right into the guest of the week. Armando Quintana III is a TED Talk speaker, uh, as well as a contributor to the Huffington Post. And he's with us today to discuss the power of relationships in your day-to-day -day life and how to really leverage those relationships to springboard you forward into the life you most desire, especially as we uh, sort of head into this realm of having just graduated. Now we're going into adulthood and professional life. Uh, Mondo, welcome to the Millennial Report. Thank you very much for having me, Wade. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely, sir. Uh, let, let's start here. You recently gave a TED Talk uh, all about relationships and mm -hmm. really how to, how to cultivate relationships. But your, your primary focus, I guess, in this TED Talk was treat every conversation like a first date. Correct, my friend. Correct. So the, the whole premise of the talk was, as I get a little older... I realized that I finished my bachelor's. I actually just graded from my master's program yesterday. Oh, congratulations. And thank you. Thank you very much. And I realized that we're all trained to grow up and to think that our grades are what really matter, our test scores, our um, ability to do well in the classroom where you're taught to, you're tested on not making a mistake when in real life, it's the mistakes that actually matter in order for you to be able to move forward. Because I would say that when you fail, human beings tend to ponder. But when people succeed, they tend to party. <laughs> so the whole talk was 
me telling people that there's three different ways that I like to go about conversing with someone. And number one would be to, when you meet someone, the first thing I do is I ask them, what has been the best part of your day? Hmm. What has been the best part of your day? Because a lot of times, I think growing up, a lot of times people ask, hey, what's up? How's it going? How are you doing? And wait, these require nothing more than a one word response. Mondo, can I if, can I interrupt you right there and say how much I despise small talk for that very reason? I appreciate that way. I appreciate it. that. Yeah. So it's like if I were to ask you, hey, wait, what's up? You I, could, I would say shut up. You, <laughs> I'd say I don't have time could, for that. I like that. I like that. <laughs> because if I ask you, Wade, what has been the best part of your day so far today? You first off, you have to think and you have to think, wow, what what has been a good moment in my day and it's only noon pacific standard time mm -hmm. so you think of something euphoric something that made you feel so good that the neurotransmitter dopamine would be rushed into your brain which is the uh basically in charge of your reward centers and anything that has to do with if you have candy that's what's released mm -hmm. if you experience something happy that's what's released so if that's released and that is because of me asking you this question and then you're going to associate that positive feeling with me. Absolutely. So that would be number one. Yeah. Number two, which I think you're going to really love if you despise small talk is to ask open-ended questions. Mm. So when you ask these questions, what I mean is not to ask someone, what's your deepest, darkest secret right away, but to simply ask, Oh, you, uh, I see you have a wedding ring on. Are you married? And <laughs> I see most of the time they'd be like, yes, I am married. So you can ask, tell me about your wife. And it's an open-ended question. So people technically usually never know when they've answered the question. So they'll tend to ramble on and on and on, and they'll give you more information than necessary. And then you could ask them a question about that. So they can say, oh, I've had two kids with my wife. Um, we met in college. So that gives me so much more ammo to say, how did you meet your wife in college? which if they're still married, I would hope is a positive euphoric experience. Yeah, definitely. And then the third step, and this is the final completion to the TED talk is every time I talk to someone in the example gives, so today I talked to you and say, I were to figure out a few things about you, Wade. What I would say is I would go on my phone afterward and I would take out my, um, my voice recorder on my iPhone mm -hmm. and I would record and I'd say May 23rd, uh, the, the, the millennium port Wade, this is how many siblings he has. This is where his mom and dad are. This is why he really doesn't like small talk. This is why he likes this. His birthday's coming up. He actually just took a vacation three weeks ago. So remember to ask him about him. So next time I see you Wade, whether it's a week from now, a month from now, or a year from now, I will know some of your most intimate things related to your family, related to your friends. And I could ask you just as if we had just finished the conversation. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of record keeping too. I mean, that sounds like a, a big investment. <laughs> yes. Well, I definitely, I definitely have a lot of files on uh, tons of people <laughs> and it sounds, it sounds weird, but this has definitely opened up more doors than my GPA, <laughs> uh, my test scores ever have because people want to feel valued and important. So why not do that way? You know, I, I love that idea too, because I think, too often we we walk around especially you're you're in san francisco right correct yeah so you're in a major city and and this is really what i want to illustrate when you're in an environment like a major city there's so much uh anonymity uh that goes with mm -hmm. a major city and even here in hollywood you walk around these streets and i mean people kind of look dead inside people people look like they've just been through hell and back you don't know what's going on in somebody's life and you're absolutely right people just want to feel valued folks just want to feel loved um and this certainly sounds like a great way to do that i i appreciate that that's uh that's been the epitome of what i've tried to show people and as a public speaker i go to dozens of schools and organizations a year also and this is what I tell the kids because I think growing up, it was all about who's going to be valid Victorian in high school, who is going to be at the top of your class in college. And I actually have a list right now called the uh, millionaire success factors and I have it on my wall. So that's why I'm looking at it. And they pulled 755 millionaires. And this was a few, this was 
a few decades ago. I can't quite tell you when, but it's mm -hmm. from a book called The Millennial Mind by Thomas J. Stanley. Mm, okay. And out of the 755 millionaires they polled, the last factor that they said that led to their success in being a multimillionaire was actually graduating near or at the top of their class. Oh. And I have heard that that is the number one factor in you succeeding in life. So I, I always find that to be interesting. And that's why it's also on my wall to remind me every day. It's a good reminder. And, and tell me a little bit more just about you here, because uh, uh, here we are launching into these ideas that you have. Uh, what made you sort of this voice for millennial relationships and strengthening relationships? What, what was your pivot point in life that turned you into that person? Well, to, to be honest, Wade, I know that as we're focused more towards millennials and we are in graduation season, mm -hmm. I, I actually, for all of my college career, I wanted to go to medical school. Okay. So I wanted to be this doctor. I loved the ability to, uh, to see someone in their most vulnerable state and to be able to take care of them, to perhaps uh, be able to deliver a baby, bring birth into this world, and perhaps at the end, maybe say this person isn't going to make it. So what are you as a family going to decide? So I went through all my bachelors and that's why I actually did my master's. And in the middle of my master's program, I think a lot of times as millennials, we think that kind of, kind of our parents way of, well, we need to get one job after college and we need to get it right away. It doesn't matter if it pays well, it doesn't matter if it pays bad, but we need to get a job because that's what, that's what we're told to do. You, you go to high school, you go to college, mm -hmm. You get a job, mm -hmm. you get your 401k, and and that's it. And I actually decided a, about two months ago, I received my acceptances into medical school, and I received a few in, uh, interviews into medical school, and I decided that this is not where I wanted to be in my stage of life. And let me tell you, Wade, that was one of the hardest decisions I think I had to make mm -hmm. in probably ever because people tend to look at you and say, oh, you're going to be a doctor. And I feel like growing up, parents always say, oh, my son's going to be this attorney. My son's going to be this physician. And there's, those are the, the typical careers that we hear when we're in elementary school. And so it was very hard for people to be able to wrap their minds around the fact of, oh, here's this 24-year-old guy who has his future laid out for him in medical school and has now decided that that's not for him. Mm -hmm. And that is the message that I, I would like people to understand that it's okay to go against society. It's okay to not really know what you're doing and that that's okay. Um, so many times we're told, this is what you should do. This is what you need to do. This is what you ought to do that you forget what you want to do. And so that is in a very long winded response, Wade, where, where I kind of am for the audience to know a little bit more about me in that I've deferred my medical school up till 2018. So if I choose to go and then I can still go next year, mm -hmm. but as of now, um, against the wishes of pretty much everyone, I've decided against it. Wow. That's, uh, that's a powerful move, sir. And I, I look at I look at this, and I, I didn't know that story about you. Okay, uh, typically, you know, we do our homework very well here, and we're uh, uh, zero it in on on what content we provide. I didn't know that story about you, and it's it's strange because today um, this is sort of the theme of the broadcast, and and you're playing right into it, and. Uh, I love that you've now shared that story and, and have been so vulnerable with us. I, I appreciate it because uh, in just a bit, we're going to be talking about uh, a column that was written that really does ask the question of, you know, are you where you thought you'd be at this age? Um, and it's mm -hmm. geared at millennials. And, um, you know, I'm not going to give too much away about that column because it's coming up, but it plays right into this idea of it's okay to pursue what you want. And, I, I love I love that you have this huge opportunity, this uh, uh, incredible opportunity, um, and and this is the way you're treating it, um, all because you know your your life and what you do with it matters. 
I, I appreciate that, Wade. For, for a little too long, um, it's easy to give into the power of when someone asks, what do you want to do when you're older? And you say, oh, I'm actually going into medical school next year for people to say, wow, that's amazing. And people think you're going to save lives and you're going to do this. But uh, there comes a point where you just have to say, you know, it, it, everyone has an opinion and it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, no one, including your own parents, are going to live your life. And coming from a Hispanic household, it's a, it's a pretty collectivist household and a collectivist culture. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times um, it's hard. It's hard to back away from that. And so any millennial out there or anyone, regardless of your age, uh, I, I'd say once you know deep inside what you want to do and what you ought to do, mm-hmm. but a lot of times we bury that underneath all the opinions of everyone else. And by the time we know it, it's we're a little too old and we we tell ourselves now that story of, oh, we're too old, so we might as well just stick with the job we've had and just live this mediocre life and probably be pretty unhappy for the majority of our lives. Like a few studies have shown that the majority of Americans are. And it's a depressing thing to think about that so many are. And I, I love I love this. I really do that, that you're sharing this idea here because millennials everywhere, uh, I, at least my millennial friends and, and the people that surround me, they all mm-hmm. sort of feel this way. There's this uh, there's this revolution brewing of, um, you know, I'm not necessarily in it for the money. I, I need to be satisfied. I, I need to be, um, you know, whole in the end. Correct. And and that's what's most important to us. Uh, I want to take a step back here uh, and talk about your your process. You know, the this idea that you have of uh, approaching people in your your three step process to really uh, helping to strengthen relationships mm-hmm. and. You know, for for a guy like you, maybe this is a little bit easier, right? You're you're a good looking guy. You probably approach people, and they're like, "Oh, he's pretty, and he makes me feel good." Um, and you know, I'm I'm sure that that probably plays a role. But when you're when you're hideous, and and you look, you know, like like myself here, uh, like I just got out of the alleyway, and I approach people and say, uh, "What's the best thing about your day?" Uh, in an increasingly antisocial world, right? We're, we're a millennial group that's very zeroed in on our technology. And I, I look down at my phone immediately because that means I don't have to look up at the person that's sitting across from me. Um, what, what do you say to the courage factor in it all? Because it takes courage to have to do something like that. Mm-hmm. So the <laughs> you, you bring up a very valid point, Wade, because I've actually had, I've had a lot of people ask me the same question that you've asked me of, oh, well, um, yeah, like they're, um, I'm not, I'm not this or I'm not that. And so a lot of times I think that as millennials or anyone, we have this story that we consistently tell ourselves, and we have this story that we say of, uh, the best example I can give is, um, let's give this example. Um, so say I'm walking, I have a friend who's walking out and they see this really pretty girl they want to talk to really pretty girl, but they have this story that they tell themselves of, oh, I'm, uh, I'm not pretty enough, so hence this is not what I deserve. Or I'm not uh, charismatic enough, so this is what I don't deserve. So I actually even, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I don't. I have my own story that I tell myself. And so I've been able to hone down what I, I just call it just a three-second rule. Mm-hmm. So anything I want to do, whether I'm in a classroom of 400 people, and every time I think the professor would ask, does anyone have a question? You know that I would assume 20% of the class has a question, but no one raises their hand. Hmm. So I've developed this rule where it says, if there's a cute girl and I wanted to approach her, I look at her, give myself three seconds. So you say one, two, and by three, you start getting up off of your chair. <laughs> because at that point, they've probably looked at you and they know you're coming over. So now you could either completely say, I'm going to ruin this and I'm just going to sit back down or little by little as time goes on. And this took me a while. So months after months after months of playing this three second rule, I raised my hand in class. And at first I was nervous. I was extremely nervous that it was going to be a dumb question Mm -hmm. or I'd go up to this pretty girl and you'd say, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh. But I think a lot of times the people are more willing to talk to you than, than people would expect because they're so lonely yeah. and when people are lonely it's uh, it's surprising what you what they will tell you 
even though you're a stranger. Well, or option three, which you didn't mention, which was um, as you approach that young lady who's alone, she pepper sprays you. So there's that option too. Uh, but but great. Let's hope treatment. that one doesn't happen, Wade. Yeah, no. It's I mean, again, you know, my life versus your life is you know <laughs> built built off of uh, reality, unfortunately. But uh, tell me, sir, you know there there are an awful lot of millennials graduating right now, uh, mm -hmm. going from the world of academia to the uh, world of adulthood and you know professionalism. What sort of advice would you give them uh, as they enter this professional world, as they enter this world of adulthood? Um, obviously, you say, you know, sort of follow your passion, make sure that you're doing what, what it is that, um, you know, feeds your soul. But is there anything that is off the top of your head that you'd like to share with millennials uh, across the country who, you know, probably are a little nervous about uh, what's next? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, Wade. It's a great question. And something that that really keeps me moving forward is I think of a quote, and I can't remember who it's by right now, but the quote says, a winner is just a loser who tried one more time. Hmm. And so that really helps me because I think if you're a millennial or if you're pretty much anyone and you're searching for a job, you're searching for maybe an entrepreneurial spirit, and you're trying to create your own business, trying to create your own your own market in a way, your own brand is it's, it's weird how things work out. You try and you try and you fail and you fail and you fail. And right when you're about to give up, right when you have almost said, this is the point where I can't go any longer, right over that mountain is going to be your success. And it's funny how the world works because I have thought of multiple different avenues of, for example, when I wanted to blog for the Huffington Post, I tried for about, I applied through the general application cycle about five, six different times, didn't work. And so I decided, all right, what's the next step? Let's uh, send our message to a few editors from the Huffington Post. And I had people reply and say, this isn't good. I had other people not respond. I had other people say, this isn't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So my last resort was, you know what? Like, let's just, let's just create something unique, create a unique, uniquely crafted message and send it to Ariana Huffington and see if she replies. And <laughs> that's the, the one top. that worked. Straight to the top you went. St straight to the top. And I think a lot of times millennials, including myself, will take rejection personally. Mm -hmm. And I think it's part of our human nature because we don't like to be rejected. Uh, failure, doesn't it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to, to say, I didn't get into school versus I succeeded and I got in because that feeds your ego. Yeah. So I, I would tell all the millennials and everyone I tell is that a winner is just a loser who tried one more time. And if you wake up and you remember that way, man, I, I do think that that makes your life a little bit better because you have two choices and I choose to be a winner every time. And I, sir, will not be a loser. So thank you hey, for man, inspiring wait. me. Here, here. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Mondo, we live in a time of great division. Uh, great political turmoil where mm -hmm. quite literally everything now is politicized and controversial. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I was just reading a story the other day about um, Jimmy Fallon and how unfortunately he um, has fallen off sort of the, the top of the ratings heap. You know, for the longest time, he was the guy at number one. And a lot of people are pointing back to when he had the now president on uh, his program as the point where mm -hmm. things started to slip and decline. And now the folks that are doing well in the uh, late night category are the ones that are, uh, you know, slamming uh, the president and, and doing their best to criticize the president. Yeah. How do you think our generation can start to heal this divide um, and, and get everyone to a better place? Because we're, we are the hero generation. Okay. We're, mm -hmm. we're this group that has been identified uh, by the, the book, The Fourth Turning, uh, a, a book by uh, two sociologists, two doctors who uh, back in the 90s, was they were looking at this sort of uh, historic trend. And they said about every 80 years or so, there's a major crisis. And mm -hmm. during that crisis, there is a generation that has to rise up and save the day. They identified whatever this generation is, 
right? They they pointed to this generation, whatever this was going to be. They didn't know it was millennials at the time because this was back in the 90s when they wrote the book. But they said whatever this time frame is and whatever this generation is, and they gave the, the year span, they said this would be the hero generation. So as the hero generation, how do you think we start to heal and get to a better place? Once again, Wade, you, uh, you've provided me with another wonderful question, uh, a pretty loaded one. So I'll do my best to to answer it in the way that I see fit personally. And I I think as a generation, but also as someone who's been a scientist his whole life, uh, we always tend to focus on things we can't control. And as human beings, I think that it's a lot easier for us to say, oh, I, I made $100,000 this year. Why didn't I make $200,000? Or... Um, you know, that, that pretty girl said yes to me on a date. Why, why can't we just continue? And why can't she be my girlfriend instead of just asking me on a date? I ask that every time. So, <laughs> yeah. so as millennials and even as anyone, I would say it's our obligation and it is our duty to little by little focus on, for example, stuff we post on social media. I see a lot of my friends post negative things and it's ironic because the more negative the more the more hits it it tends to have is what i noticed yeah. there there can be something of the nature of uh if i scroll through my facebook feed or even my instagram feed there's people who just want to comment on everything and it's usually negative yep. they'll say something if it's a picture of donald trump it'll be negative if it's a picture of bernie sanders it'll be negative mm -hmm. so I think the first thing is for people to know that if you master your emotions, you master your life. And that's something that I am slowly trying to do. If I am with one of my friends and he says something that I don't agree with at all, instead of my first reaction being defensive and to guard myself, to ask him, oh, like, why do, why do you feel that way? How, how does it make you feel when you say this? How does it make you feel when you say that? Because there's a lot of times where we we try to view someone else's opinion through our own shoes. Mm -hmm. And when I think of Mimi, J Jimmy Fallon and what you said, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are, are letting our emotions just drive where we go. And when we let our emotions drive, let's think of war. War to me is not started with logic. It started with emotion. Mm -hmm. Divorce is more often than not, I would say ended with emotion than logic. When I think about what, the majority of my friends do when they say, should I do homework or should I go out and party? They're driven by emotion instead of logic. So I think it's up to us to say, you know, like stuff that's happening, we can only control it this much. And once certain people get out of, for example, government and certain people uh, start taking their place, we can choose what we want to do. And as long as we are emotional, not, thoroughly emotionally driven, excuse me, Wade, I think it could be a, pr a pretty darn good world, but it's going to be up to us. Absolutely. Keep your emotion in check. I uh, appreciate the thoughts and uh, thank you. I, I know that's probably not what you were expecting to, to be asked here today, but um, it's something that I'm, I'm asking most guests to come on the show now because it's going to be up to us, just like you said. And so mm -hmm. um, the, the more sort of thought leaders that I can get involved uh, to share their ideas as to how we can move forward, how we can heal, uh, I think the better. So I appreciate you, um, you know, having the courage to share your thoughts here today about that. I appreciate the question too, Wade. You bet. Uh, how might our audience learn more about you? Well, they can, um, anyone who would like to reach out to me can reach out on my Instagram, my Twitter, or my Facebook at Armando, A-R-M-A-N-D-O, Q3. Or you can go to my website at the mfmanifesto.com. And it hasn't been updated in a little while, but um, if you go on there, I'll get it through email and we can go ahead and chat and you can tell me whatever you would like. We can talk, get in contact. I'm always here to be a helping hand and help you or even you help me in any way. Awesome. You got a beautiful spirit, sir. Thanks so much for being a part of the broadcast today. I appreciate it, Wade. Thank you very much for having me. You bet. Mondo Quintana, check out his TED Talks, too, over there on the YouTubes. Hey, 
When we come back, you stick around because uh, we're asking that question. Are you where you thought you'd be at this age? It's a column that I can't wait to share with you and uh, a few thoughts that entered my mind upon reading it. There's a lot more to come. Stick with us. It's the Millennial Report, live from Hollywood. I want people to think about our politics here today in America, because I'm telling you guys, I don't know of a single nation in the history of the world that's been able to solve its problems when half the people in a country absolutely hate the other half people in that country. Turn on the news and watch these parliaments around the world where people throw chairs at each other and punches and ask yourself, how does that make you feel about those countries? It doesn't give you a lot of confidence about those countries. Now, I'm not arguing that we're anywhere near that here tonight, but we're flirting with it. We're flirting with it in this body and we are flirting with it in this country. We are becoming a society incapable of having debates anymore. In this country, if you watch the big policy debates that are going on in America, no one ever stops to say, I think you're wrong, I understand your point of view, I get it, you have some valid points, but let me tell you why I think my view is better. I don't hear that anymore. Here's what I hear almost automatically, and let me be fair, from both sides of these debates. Immediately, immediately, as soon as you offer an idea, the other side jumps and says, the reason why you say that is because you don't care about poor people, because you only care about rich people, because you're this or you're that or you're the other. And I'm just telling you guys, we, have, we are reaching a point in this republic where we're not going to be able to solve the simplest of issues because everyone is putting themselves in a corner where everyone hates everybody. Now, I don't pretend to say that I am not myself from time to time in heated debates outside of this forum, been guilty of perhaps hyperbole, and for those, I'm not proud of it. But I got to tell you, I think what's at stake here tonight and as we debate moving forward is not simply some rule but the ability of the most important nation on earth to debate in a productive and respectful way the pressing issues before us. And I am so grateful that God has allowed me to be born and to live and to raise my family in a, na in a nation where people with such different points of view are able to debate those things in a way that doesn't lead to war, that doesn't lead to overthrows, that doesn't lead to violence. And you may take that for granted. I'm telling you that right now all around the world tonight there are people that if they stood up here and said the things that we say about the, per the president or others in authority, you go to jail. If this body is incapable of having those debates, there will be no place in this country where those debates can occur. And I, I think every single one of us, to our great shame, will live to regret it. Welcome back to the show. You know, uh... I read this column from the Huffington Post this week called It's Okay If You're Not Where You Thought You'd Be. And it focuses on where you might be in your life right now. And it's by writer Samantha Matt. Now, she describes um, sort of her place in society right now and, and how she's dealing with um, some of the, the harsher ends of adulthood. Uh, it begins, if you asked me years ago where I thought I'd be in life at age 28, this is what I would tell you. High-powered job, money in the bank, married, trying to have my first kid before 30. So I could be a young mom, getting ready to buy a home, basically a real adult, with all of her S together. But now I am 28, and I'm so far from where I thought I'd be at this age years ago. I'm not married. I don't make a lot of money. I still like to party. And she says, side note, not like I did in my early 20s. I'm nowhere near thinking about buying a home. I couldn't handle having a kid right now, as I can barely handle taking care of myself. But even though I'm happy living life the way a 28-year-old wants me to live life, part of me is constantly like, girl, what happened to our life plan? Why don't you have any money? Why don't you want to have a baby right now? Is something wrong with you? She asks herself. She goes on to say, because of this, my mood lately has been a combination of stress and anxiety. I've been unenthused and unimpressed with myself. I'm not in the mood for anything, but I'm also in the mood for everything. It's like I'm waiting for someone to flip a switch so my whole life can change. And my whole personality can change on top of that. So my wants, needs, and dreams can change to what I wanted them to be years ago at 28.
but that isn't happening. She continues, as a kid, you form an idea of the person you will be when you grow up. This is due to society, movies, television, and people asking you where you see yourself 5, 10, and even 20 years from now. You see and hear of people certain ages doing and accomplishing certain things. So you begin to associate ages with milestones. 21 is the age you party. 25 is the age you start to figure out your life and your career path. And 26 is when you stop partying altogether. 27 is when you get engaged. 28 is when you have a high-powered job. 29 is when you buy a home. 30 is the time you start having kids. As you get older, though, you realize that this timeline you created for yourself is BS. But for some reason, you still feel like you're expected to accomplish all these things. And you still feel like you're disappointing people by not accomplishing these things. Samantha Matt shares this story because it's one that um, I think not only is something so powerful that she's trying to deal with right now, but I think it's reflective of so many millennials at this moment. Don't you ask yourself many of the same questions? This isn't just about graduates here today. We're talking to the older millennials, the ones that have been out of college for a while. Very briefly, if you've watched this show before, you know the good lie theory, right? It's the theory that I've been working on that says, for years, when we were kids, we were told, hey, in order to achieve the American dream, you got to go to school, get a degree, move on into a corporate office, get that nice corner office, you'll make a million more dollars in your lifetime, right? You'll slide on into a lovely, beautiful home. You'll have a great family, white picket fence, the uh, dog running around. You'll have a great retirement. The American dream is yours if you just followed these steps. Something that I harp on a lot is that uh, that is not a reality anymore. Those things don't happen. It's a narrative that for so long we've been trying to make real still. It's a narrative that many of our uh, grandparents push upon us because it worked for them. It doesn't work anymore. We live in a different world. We live in a time where this good lie theory, and we call it the good lie because getting an education and working hard and trying to achieve great things, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Education is important. You should never stop learning. But when you've been lied to, you start to get a little disappointed because you realize these things aren't panning out. Many of our parents even are dealing with how the narrative works for them. So they're asking us, why are you still living at home? What the hell is your problem? How come you can't find a job? We're all dealing with something because the narrative doesn't quite add up anymore. Nothing is normal about who we are as millennials. Housing, marriage, social issues, education. It's long said that, uh, you know, we're, we're fond of killing things. What have millennials killed now? Millennials are killing the housing market. We're killing the taxi market, right? The invention of Uber and Lyft. That's all we do. We don't take taxis anymore. We don't buy diamonds anymore. Right? We buy other rocks because those are more important to us. So we're killing everything. There's always something wrong with millennials. But nothing is normal about who we are. We're changing the entire dynamic of what it means to be young in America. Can we all just agree to blow up this idea that we need to be somewhere at a certain age and that the world is changing, right? The world is changing and we are changing it. Societal norms are not norms anymore. And while the constructs that have been in place for decades are starting to crumble, we are the generation identified as the one who will not only save everyone, but also the ones who will clean up the mess. In the book, The Fourth Turning, authored by social experts Strauss and Howe, 
They identified us as the hero generation back in the 90s based on historic patterns that indicated we would be the demographic that would have to deal with the fallout of a major crisis. I don't know if we've reached that crisis yet. It feels like every day there's another crisis, right? Every day there's something huge to deal with. It's exhausting, especially if you keep your head in the news like I do. It's overwhelming. It's very hard to deal with. But these authors identify millennials as the hero generation, the group that will save everyone when it comes to the next big crisis. Now, I really don't think that we've hit that crisis yet. As bad as things are, right, and as uh, terrorism continues to be a problem and as we continue to deal with economic fallout and political turmoil, there's a lot going on. A lot of weight on our shoulders, but we are not there yet. I think there's something much bigger coming. God forbid we have to deal with another major crisis. But in the end, it'll be up to us. So stop comparing your life to some old cultural dictation of what it should be or how it's supposed to be. And realize that you're living history right now. Each of us is playing a role in redefining what the world looks like moving forward. The question really shouldn't be, are you where you thought you'd be at this age? It should be, are you proud of who you are in a time where nothing makes sense and everything seems to be on the brink of chaos? There's the question that you should be asking yourself. I'm interested in your take. Let me know uh, if you are where you thought you'd be at this age and whether it matters to you or not, you can reach out to me by uh, writing or recording to me on Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat by searching at WadeWire. That's W-A-D-E-W-I-R-E. Hey, stick around. My message to the graduating class of 2017 is straight ahead. You're watching The Millennial Reports. This is the Millennial Report with Wade Heath. to share with you the commencement address uh, I feel should be given at graduations across the country. These words uh, come from my heart, and I think every millennial that is graduating this month should hear something like this. Thank you, Board of Education, Administration, Faculty, Distinguished Guests, and of course, uh, the Class of 2017! Today, we turn the page on this chapter of our life and start a new story. A story that we have been preparing, studying, and training for. This new story should excite and thrill each of us. After all, it belongs to us, and what we do next will impact what's written moving forward. As a graduating class that has always been plugged into the digital universe, and can't recall a time that America wasn't engaged in a war effort somewhere in the world, our view of how things are and work is unique. Having grown up with access to information at our fingertips, not knowing something is as uh, solvable as a Google search, we've been surrounded by instant celebrities and reality stars our entire upbringing. Where people like Paris Hilton and Kim Kardashian are famous for really just being famous. We are by and large more tolerant and open-minded 
than many of the generations before us. And because of that, we hold the relationships we've cultivated very close to our hearts. Our squad goals are admirable. But as we start a new story, we should proceed with caution. The world is a far different place than it was when we entered this institution four years ago. The United States has never had more debt than it has right now. America continues to print money as a way to sustain the economy, all while decent jobs have dried up. Most entry-level positions now require some sort of experience in order to be considered for hiring. On top of that, add the competition for such spots, and it's become cutthroat. For decades, we've been told to go to college, get a degree, and not only will you make one million more dollars over the course of your life, but that we would be able to walk right into a great job. Be able to afford a nice home and start a beautiful adult life. Our generation is the most educated group our country has ever known. And that is absolutely something to be celebrated. Sadly, it has come at the cost of well over $1 trillion in student loan debt. What's worse is that because so many of us now have a degree, there's an oversaturation of people with degrees and no place for them to go. Home prices have now rebounded to pre-market crash levels. Levels that, when it crashed the first time, took away the retirement of my mom and dad and had them jobless within two years. And if you do end up getting a job with that degree you earned, don't expect to rake in the cash, as millennials are earning 20% less than our parents did at the same time in life. Unfortunately, the national narrative has still not changed, even though reality has. We have been sold a good lie. I call it a good lie because bettering ourselves through education and striving for excellence isn't wrong. In fact, it's something that we should strive for our entire existence. But the means in which to achieve it has become wrong. No one seems to want to acknowledge that things have changed because those that surround us, such as our family and friends, they still believe in the good lie because it worked for many of them. We must understand that in order to succeed in this new America, we need to stop listening to the narrative we've been told works and create a new narrative that actually does. It needs to be said here and now, the American dream as we know it is dead. We are facing an adverse political situation in this country where two parties have stopped standing on principle and have degenerated into little more than disrespectful, self-interested mirrors of one another. Hear me when I tell you that no political party has the answer. Neither of them have the answer we are seeking because the parties we know only want more power for themselves or for us to allow government to be the solution. The America that once was had always looked to the individual for solutions. Government has never solved anything, nor has it made life easier for anyone. Globally, terrorism remains a consistent issue, as does conflict among people of differing faiths and beliefs. The world economy is also so fragile that any small event might send it spiraling out of control. To say things look bleak would be an understatement. 
but I'm here today to let you know that there is still a flicker in the candle. There's still a light to guide us out of the darkness. And that light lives within our generation. While our window is definitely closing, we still have a shot at changing the world and our home for the better. We have just become the largest living generation. Our influence and power has yet to be tapped. But as we begin our new story, we must not allow it to be hijacked by radicals of any ideology. People that tell us if we just make concessions on a few of the truths that we hold close, that we can have something else or walk away with some sort of trophy for the trouble. Do not fall victim to the cult of personality. And along the same line, we must not silence those we disagree with. Because sometimes those that disagree with us force us to question our beliefs and either strengthen our position or help us to understand that there might be a better way. Remember, class of 2017, no one owes us anything. And we are entitled to nothing. Because anyone that can give us something can also take it away. We have the power now. We are responsible for the story waiting to be written. It's up to us to use the pen with honor, bravery, and kindness. If we come together and trust one another, there's no telling the type a bestseller will create. So rise up, graduates. The world needs us now more than ever. Now, before we depart, some words to live by. It's really three things. The first thing is about opportunity. The second thing is about being sexy. And the third thing is about living life. So first, opportunity. I believe that opportunity looks a lot like hard work. When I was 13, I had my first job with my dad carrying shingles up to the roof. And then I got a job washing dishes at a restaurant. And then I got a job in a grocery store deli. And then I got a job in a factory sweeping Cheerio dust off the ground. And I've never had a job in my life that I was better than. I was always just lucky to have a job. And every job I had was a stepping stone to my next job. And I never quit my job until I had my next job. And so opportunities look a lot like work. Number two, being sexy. The sexiest thing in the entire world is being really smart. And being thoughtful. And being generous. Everything else is crap, I promise you. It's just crap that people try to sell to you to make you feel like less. So don't buy it. Be smart, be thoughtful, and be generous. The third thing is something that I just relearned when I was making this movie about Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs said, when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way that it is. And that your life is to live your life inside the world and try not to get in too much trouble and maybe get an education and get a job and make some money and have a family. But life can be a lot broader than that when you realize one simple thing. And that is that everything around us that we call life was made up by people that are no smarter than you. And you can build your own things. You can build your own life that other people can live in. So build a life. Don't live one, build one.
Really want to thank you for being a part of the broadcast today. Uh, for all my new friends, welcome aboard. And for those of you that would like to get in touch with me, you can do so. Head on over to uh, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and the Twitters by searching at Wadewire. That's W-A-D-E-W-I-R-E. Would love to get to know you there. And uh, you know what? Remember, you matter and you do make a difference. No matter what you've heard, you are significant. Each and every week, we share the best of a generation right here. Thanks for being a part of the Millennial Report. We'll see you next week. The party doesn't end here. Subscribe to the Millennial Report on YouTube for new videos every week. Just visit MillennialLive.com.